Hi, and welcome back to Kamali's Church YouTube channel. I hope that you're all doing well in the current circumstances, but please don't forget our offer of support should you uh, need us for anything at all. Don't hesitate to make contact. Now this week we look forward to hearing from Jonathan Fraser uh, in a short while as he brings a word to us. But firstly, I'm going to hand over to Janice, who will read from God's Word. And then after Johnny has spoken, I'll bring our time together uh, to a closing prayer. So, over to Janice. The Bible reading today is taken from Psalm 102, and we're reading from verse 18 to verse 28. Let this be recorded for future generations so that a people not yet born will praise the Lord. Tell them the Lord looked down from his heavenly sanctuary. He looked down to earth from heaven to hear the groans of the prisoners, to release those condemned to die. And so the Lord's fame will be celebrated in Zion, his praises in Jerusalem, when multitudes gather together and kingdoms come to worship the Lord. He broke my strength in midlife, cutting short my days. But I cried to him, O oh my God, who lives forever, don't take my life while I am so young. Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them. But you are always the same. You will live forever. The children of your people will live in security. Their children's children will thrive in your presence. Amen. Janice, thank you for that reading. Now let's hand over to Johnny Fraser as he opens up God's word for us. The theme that I've been thinking a lot about recently and what I thought I would talk to you about this morning is that great and fundamental doctrine of God's immutability. And I know there'll be some of you who switch off when you hear the word doctrine, please don't. There'll be others among you who think that immutability sounds boring and dusty and irrelevant. But doctrine, of course, when it's functioning properly, is simply that which enables the church to confess and to proclaim what it believes as clearly as it possibly can. And the doctrine of God's immutability, specifically of God's changelessness, is thoroughly biblical, as all doctrine must be. And it's of vital importance when it comes to the question of where to ground our hope. In our passage, Psalm 102, verses 18 through 28, is one of the many biblical bases of this great doctrine. That God is unchanging, and thus that God is constant, that God is reliable, that God can be depended upon. That he is the solid rock of our salvation in, turbulent, in a turbulent world of impermanence and corrosion. In the words of the old hymn, change and decay in all around I see, O thou who changest not abide with me. In a nutshell it's that God, our God, remains the same yesterday, today and forever. Shall not be moved, nor shall he shift and adapt to circumstances, nor shall he be led by fleeting passions or emotions. Neither he nor his plans or purposes will be altered. He is who he is. As he revealed himself to, to be to Moses at the burning bush, I am who I am, period. He is the same through every generation. As Psalm 102 states, In the beginning he laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens too are the work of his hands. Then the psalmist goes on, They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. And so much is it the case that God will remain as he is that the children of God's people and their descendants, their children's children, will live in the same presence and be established before the same God as the psalmist. 
And he's the same God before before whom we come this morning, the same God in whose presence we gather, the same God in whom the work of our hands is established. Because he does not change, he is from age to age the same. And it's on that changelessness, in God's changelessness, that our hope is founded. So within the parameters of Psalm 102, verse 27 is the central focus of what I want to talk about, about hope in troubling times. But you are the same. As the great reformer Martin Luther put it, you remain as you are. And your years have no end. Literally in the Hebrew, your years are never completed or fulfilled. They are infinite. It's of vital importance, is it not, that we ground our hope in something sure and certain, something permanent and lasting, in something or someone who does not change, lest our hope be dashed and cut adrift. If we put our hope in our own humanity, we'll find, won't we, that human nature cannot be relied upon. Human beings are fickle, temperamental and often unreliable. People let us down. Or what if we put our hope in scientific advances? The COVID-19 vaccine, for example, is being rolled out as we speak. And as a society and as individuals, we've invested a lot of hope in that. But even if COVID-19 becomes a thing of the past before this year is through, we'll still fall ill. We'll still get sick. We'll still grow old. We'll still die. So what about if we put our hope in technological developments? It can't be argued that technology hasn't enriched our lives uh, these past months in particular, for which even this morning we ought to be thankful. But more often than not, it seems technological developments do more harm than good. Economic interests, rather than human flourishing, still drive innovation to a great extent. Investment in military technology still outpaces investment in every other sector. Artificial intelligence robs people of dignity and self-worth. And over and above and far more worrying than the fact that overexposure to smartphones and tablets is affecting our posture, our eyesight and our sleep patterns for the worst, is the fact that studies are consistently showing that advances in social technologies are making people lonelier and more depressed than ever before. So you might well put your hope in humanity, in scientific advances or in technological developments. Progress might well be your mantra. But all these things will come up short. By definition, they will shift and change with new discoveries, the next big innovation, with differing interpretations of the data. As such, none of these things offer a secure and lasting ground for your hope. So I pray that we would never put our hope in such things, in ourselves and in our fellow human beings or in our scientific know-how or in our technological ingenuity. And I trust your prayer is the same. But let me highlight the fact that likewise we can't put our hope in a too small God. Although we often think this way, or at least I do, God is not a bigger version of us. We can't rely on someone like us only bigger and stronger. Our hope cannot be in a God whose plans are shaped, influenced and altered by the petty goings on of human beings like us. Not in a God who evolves and shifts and changes, changes his mind in response to situations and circumstances. Not in a God whose mood fluctuates dependent on the behaviour of his creatures. Not in a God who modifies his plans in response to our every beck and call. Where is the security in such a God? Where is the anchor for our soul? Where is the insurance and the assurance of our hope? It cannot be in a fickle, changing God. So thank heavens, the God of Psalm 102, the God of Scripture as a whole, is not like that. The God of Scripture is unfathomable in his greatness, completely other than ourselves in his majesty, over and above every category in his beauty and his glory, and unchanging in his nature throughout all eternity. But alas, how many souls have been lost from the fold because we've sold them a vision of God that is simply not sufficient to ground their hope in times of trial and seasons of change. 
a cosy God who panders to our every whim, a God almighty, not a God almighty. God remains the same. Our hope can only be secure when it is grounded in the nature and identity of the God we worship who changes not. God is unceasingly faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Now that's the God we can rely on. That's the God who's worthy of our trust. That's the God in whom we find security. That's the God who underwrites, ensures, signs, seals and guarantees our hope. Our God is not in a God who changes, for with such a God there is no anchor for the soul, there is no solid rock upon which to rest the foot of our faith. No, in God's changelessness is our hope. So note the progression of the psalm as a whole, and you can see it play out. We can see the turmoil of human life, life that's fleeting and always changing. We read that the psalmist knows all too well that well that his days pass away like smoke, that his heart is struck down like grass and is withered in verses 4 and 5. In the midst of his nightmare situation he becomes all too aware that his days are like an evening shadow, that he withers away like grass in verse 11. But then note the importance of the word but in verse 12. So as a human being, albeit in a, a difficult and terrifying situation, he's tossed about in every direction. He's scared, he's anxious, he's aware that his days are limited, that his very being is subject to change, that he's growing weaker, that he's more infirm. But, verse 12, God is not like that. God is enthroned forever and will, will be remembered throughout all generations. And as such, hope can be found in him. Then moving forward to verses 23 and forward, God has broken the psalmist's strength in the middle of his life. He has shortened his days and God only is the one whose years endure throughout all generations. The earth and heavens will perish, but you, God, will remain. Verse 26. All creation will wear out like a garment, but you are the same and your years have no end. The whole flow and rhythm and structure of the psalm highlights our frailty, the inescapable reality that we are subject to change and decay, that our days are like grass, like an evening shadow, a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes, as James puts it in James chapter 4 verse 14, but that God remains the same, that he does not change and precisely for that reason mortal men and women tossed about by trials and circumstances changing aging dying can lean into rely upon and find security in the permanence of God as they ground their hope in him we're dying creatures Matthew Henry says and our interests and comforts are dying but God is an ever-living everlasting God. The psalmist is acutely aware of the brevity of his lifespan and the frailty of his frame, indeed of the universe itself, but in our passage, a passage of great power, he contrasts this with the eternity of God and he knows that when frail, weak, distressed human beings place their hope in an unchanging God, they find a safe haven from the trials of life and a sure and certain hope for the future to come. Now note, and this is particularly relevant, I think, given our current circumstances, that the psalmist comes to an awareness of the shortness of his days, of the frailty of his life, in the midst of his distress. Often it's these days of distress, that's verse 2, that focus our minds on the frailty and fleeting nature of human life. Often it's just such circumstances that remind us that we are not as strong and secure as we like to think we are. That we, unlike God, are subject to change. That we weaken and we fade and we decay. When enemies surround us and taunt us, that's the psalmist experience. Or when a virus wreaks havoc on a population as we're experiencing. 
the fragility and transitoriness of our lives come into sharp relief. That's what the psalmist experienced, that's what we're experiencing, that's what people experience day in, day out. Because of coronavirus, yes, absolutely, but actually for a whole host of other reasons above and beyond. So think of the pressures that young people face from social influencers to chop and change their appearance and their identity in a myriad of different contexts that demand conformity. Their plans change or are forced into being changed by pandemics that unveil our weakness and futility as exams are cancelled and futures are thrown into question. And families fall apart and deprivation limits dreams at the same time as it increases hunger. Opportunities are denied. Loneliness and isolation weaken resolve and affect mental health. Sigmund Bauman, who's a Polish sociologist analysing the culture of the Western world, noted the growing conviction that change is the only permanence and uncertainty the only certainty. Where do people experiencing these things find hope? In a God who wills one thing today and another tomorrow. In a God who changes his mind or who amends his plans, I think not. Who could confide in such a God or be encouraged by him? A God who only emphasises that everything is impermanent and uncertain. No, it's as the psalmist knew. They can find their hope only in our God, who is permanent and certain. In him who, when all around is fading, is the same and whose years have no end. The God who does not change in him and in him alone is hope for weary ones like you and me. Hope for the hopeless. Our God is unchangeable. Our God can be relied upon. His nature is always the same. His will is invariable. His purposes are sure. God is the fixed point in a churning and decaying universe for those who truly know him. That's the hope that we hold on to and that's the hope that we have to offer people. Exactly the same hope that the author of Psalm 102 held on to. Hope that recognises that through the crisis of the present, God remains constant. God remains the same. That you are the same and your years have no end. I think it's been the case, however, that we haven't always been as forthright about God's changelessness as we could have been. Certainly in some circles, God being unchanging has fallen out of favour because they say it makes God out to be impersonal and uncaring and disinterested and unresponsive. And that certainly doesn't chime with the God we know and we certainly wouldn't want to tell people who are not yet Christians that that's what God is like. But God's unchangingness does not mean that he is impersonal and uncaring. Note that in the context of, but you are the same and your years have no end. In our passage, verse 27, God will rise up, in verse 13, and have compassion, also verse 13. That he will build up the ruins of Zion, in verse 16. That he will respond to prayer, in verse 17. That he will look down from heaven, in verse 19. Hear the groans of the prisoners, in verse 20. And set free those who are doomed to die, also verse 20. In other words... To say that God is unchanging, that he remains the same as he has always been, means that not only who he is, but what he does remains constant and unchanging. In other words, because God is unchangingly holy, he will always act in accordance with his holiness. Because he's unchangingly just, he will always act justly. Because he is unchangingly true, he will always act truthfully. Because he is unchangingly good, he will always be good. So, of course, he rises up with compassion, hearing the, the groans of the oppressed, looking down from heaven, rebuilding the, 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 the ruins of Zion. Because God is a God who unceasingly and unchangingly rises up, rises up in compassion to build up the ruins in response to prayer. He'll always look down from heaven. He'll always hear the groans of the oppressed. He'll always set the prisoners free. It's not that he rises up sometimes when he's in the mood or sets the prisoners free when he feels like it. It's not that he does these things as a one-off. He unceasingly and unchangingly and eternally does these things. That's who God is. That's what God does. And he will not change. 
He will remain the same forever and ever. God's attitude towards us now is the same as it was in the farthest reaches of eternity past and will be in the farthest reaches of eternity to come. The Father loves us to the end. So as it was said of Jesus, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Because God is unchangingly love, he will always be loving to the very end. When we come to God, we will always find him as he has shown himself to be in Jesus Christ. Compassionate and kind and caring and gracious and loving and the same yesterday, today and forever. So to be absolutely clear, to talk of God being unchanging is absolutely not to assert that he's uncaring, that he's not interested in the plight of men and women. To talk of God's changelessness is to assert that unceasingly and without variation he loves his people and is consistently compassionate towards his creatures. To talk of God's changelessness is to say that he unwaveringly and never-endingly loves the last, the least and the lost. To talk of God's changelessness is to proclaim with confidence and joy that in him our hope is secure and it will never be found wanting. A.W. Tozer put it like this, what peace it brings to the Christian's heart to realise that our Heavenly Father never differs from himself. In coming to him at any time, we need not wonder whether we shall find him in a receptive mood. He is always receptive to misery and need as well as to love and faith. He does not keep office hours nor set aside periods when he will see no one. Neither does he change his mind about anything. Today, this moment, he feels towards his creatures, toward babies, towards the sick, the fallen, the sinful, exactly as he did when he sent his only begotten son into the world to die for mankind. God never changes his moods or cools his affections nor loses his enthusiasm. In God's changelessness is our hope. And let me just say a word on the unchangingness of God's word and of God's purposes. The word of God is, unchange, is as unchanging as the God who breathed it out. The words of men are unstable things, J.I. Packer writes, but not so the words of God. They stand forever as abidingly valid expressions of his mind and thought. No circumstances prompt him to recall them. No changes in his own thinking require him to amend them. So we ought never to shy away from our commitment to the Bible, the unchanging, immutable word of God. And God's purposes for his redeemed people also will not change. And God's purpose is to bring his own into full enjoyment of their promised inheritance into their home. So the being of God, the attributes and actions of God and the word and purpose of God are unchanging and so reliable and so able to ground our hope in an uncertain, confusing and often painful world. When all around within and without I see change, I see the dimming of this world's joy, I see decay setting in, when I'm confused, when I'm lonely, when it hurts, yet you are the same and your years have no end. Indeed, God is the same as he has always been. He will be the same in what we would call billions of years from now. And I can rest secure in that and ground my hope in him. That is the reason to stake your hope on the changelessness of God, to let down the anchor of your soul into the constant, un un unchanging, utterly reliable being of God, sure and steadfast, to reach out from your human frailty to the security which the eternal unchanging God alone can give. Because God does not change, your future is secure. And with this I finish. Towards the end of the summer holidays in 2018, 
We as a family were waiting in Ullapu to board the ferry destined for Stornoway from where we were driving south to Harris for a week's holiday. It wasn't a bad day, I remember. It was slightly overcast, but then it's the Highlands and there was a gentle sea breeze. Now we were travelling with friends and as we were in good time for the ferry, we were chatting in the car park. Remember when you could do things like that? And at that point, our friend's mobile phone pinged and it was his father reporting that he'd been checking the wave forecast. Now, I never knew that such a thing even existed up until this point. And that the waves on the Minch were being measured at four metres that day. That's 13 feet in old money. Now, for some reason in my mind, I thought four metres didn't sound too bad. But by way of comparison and to demonstrate how wrong I was, four metres is the height of a standard double-decker bus, give or take a few centimetres. It's the height of an average female giraffe. To say that cross that crossing was challenging would be an understatement. As soon as we got out into the open water, the significance of four metre waves hit home. It wasn't so much that the boat went up and down, but that the boat went up and then slapped back down onto the water. In our party, four adults and three children flat on our backs with the other child vomiting into a sick bag. Everywhere you looked, passengers were a very odd shade of green and every toilet cubicle was occupied with seasick individuals. I've never really minded being at sea in the past, but never was I so glad to put my feet on solid ground as I was that day. Charles Spurgeon, that prince of preachers, wrote in his devotional for the morning of 2nd November these words, the delight which the mariner feels when after having been tossed about for many a day, he steps again upon the solid shore, is the satisfaction of a Christian when amidst all the changes of this troublesome life, he rests the foot of his faith upon this truth. I am the Lord and I change not. Though all else shifts and changes and erodes, yet you remain the same and your years will never end. It's in God's changelessness that our hope lies. Amen. Johnny, thank you for that. Very much a, a word of the season, so thank you. Now let's come before the Lord in prayer now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do celebrate you and enjoy you. And because of your nature, because you are unchanging, because your will can't be bent or manipulated in any way, because your promises are safe and solid and secure, we can have hope in our hearts. And we can contemplate the future, even though it is in many parts unknown, in many ways, perhaps even beyond our imagining. And yet, Father, we know that whatever circumstances lie ahead, we can face them with hope in our hearts and with courage because of who you are and because of what you have done and because what of, of what Christ has done on the cross for us. And salvation has been secured. Sin has been defeated. Death has been overcome because of his mighty resurrection from the grave. And so, Father, we thank you uh, that we can face the future, not with despair in our hearts, but instead with trust. Because your words and you are trustworthy and true. And so, Father, we thank you uh, that you bring that peace to our hearts. And we just ask for that peace to, to flood the lives of those who are going through times of trouble. Perhaps those who have been bereaved in recent days and weeks and maybe even years, Father, that pain can still sting, of course. So, Father, we, th we think of all those who find themselves in that place today and those who are ill, those who are struggling with their health. Uh, those, Father, who, whose struggles are perhaps more of a the nature of the relationships with others or perhaps it is in regards to employment or, or finances or whatever it may be, Father, whatever 
sin they're struggling with and such like. Lord, we just ask that you they would look to you and see you for who you are and therefore be able to face their future um, with, with hope and with courage, knowing that you are with them in all circumstances and you will not leave them or forsake them simply because of who you are. It's your nature to be trustworthy and true, to be full of love and mercy, to be a God of power and yet a God of grace. And so, Father, we thank you that for who you are. And we just ask, Father, that you would continue to bless our church, build your church in this our land. And our church family here at Kamiles, we just ask, Father, that you we could play some small part in that. So bless us and help us and lead us, guide us and show us who you would have us be. In Jesus' name, amen.